God turns bad things for good. Did you know that? Romans 8.28 says, And we know, say we know, all things work together for good to those who love God and who are called, uh, called according to His purpose. You know that. Romans 8, verse 28. We know that. We know all things are working together for our good. God wants you to know this so much that He redeemed you. He redeemed you as a lesson, as an eternal lesson that He takes bad things, turns it for good. Coronavirus looks bad. Coronavirus shut down businesses. It closed down schools. And it just looks really bad, doesn't it? But since we are to be like God, we need to extract something good out of this. And I want to declare coronavirus is a blessing if you have eyes of faith to see. Let me name you a couple of blessings. I've said it since last year. The lockdown worldwide looks a lot to me like Israel on the day of Shabbat. The empty streets, no activity, businesses closed, everybody's back with their family, and a lot of them seeking God, pursuing spiritual activity. It looks a lot like the Shabbat. So I said since last year, I said it looks to me like God is up to something, and He is enforcing the Shabbat worldwide. Now, why is that important? Because if God does that worldwide without the church's consent, then He's preparing the second coming of His Son, Jesus Christ. Because that's the characteristic of the millennial reign of Jesus. When God says, no work, everybody stops. But if God said that to Christians, what happens? They get into arguments and debates, especially the Western ones. Well, how do you know the Sabbath means the Sabbath? Does the Sabbath mean Friday or Saturday or Sunday? Which one does it really mean? Maybe the true Sabbath is the spiritual rest, and they'll just get on fighting. And meanwhile, no, nothing has happened. Nobody sees Jesus. Nobody hears Jesus. All they hear is bickering Christians. It's utterly stupid. Utterly stupid. No action. It's faith without works. It's dead faith. But that's how Christianity has become. And coronavirus has come as a blessing to say, I'm going to enforce the Sabbath whether your theology agrees with me or not. You're going to rest. You got a business? Tough. You're going to rest. And the amazing thing is, a lot of businesses suffered, but a lot of businesses, in Australia anyway, the news from our you know, economic report is, it did not affect Australia as badly as we first thought. Meaning what? It's a blessing in disguise. Some businesses did better. Some churches, like ours, did better. And we'll tell you how. So, coronavirus seems to be a catalyst for Jesus. The word catalyst is a word from chemistry that means a substance that initiates or accelerates a chemical reaction without itself being affected. Used metaphorically, it means something that causes an important event to happen. Well, did you know they had many surveys and many reports in the news that people said, people reported during lockdown, they prayed more. And I totally believe it because our church went into lockdown prayer. Before coronavirus, we have like the big prayer, we call it power prayer, twice a month. Can hardly get anybody to show up. Now we have prayer every day, and the Zoom meeting is full. It's great. Always got people there. Always got people there. People are praying more. People are reading the Bible more. People are reading the Bible with their children more. So coronavirus has been a catalyst for Jesus, and He did not need our theological consent. He says a rest is a rest. What else do you need to interpret this? A rest is a rest. You must have a rest. And if you will not have one day for me, not footy, not movies, not your own activity, one day is mine, then I'm going to take it from you in seven months, all straight in a row. Can you not see this? Can you not see that God is up to something? Number two, blessing. 
The first blessing is an enforced Shabbat. Number two blessing is, from our ministry perspective, I'm not speaking for all, but from, from our ministry perspective, during this time, it was a blessing because we built online church. We outreach more, we outreach to more than our physical neighbor. We made disciples worldwide, and we're aiming to grow that to 4,000. We believe there are 4,000 people called of God to belong to Discover Church Online. But as we grew, I, I was constantly telling other pastors, who, whoever I felt would listen. You know, a lot of pastors are busy with their own ministry, so they're not listening. But I, I told them, I said, you know, are you on social media? And literally from many pastors, they saw social media as irrelevant, if not satanic. Like people who are on social media are wasting their time. So think about it. You know, before coronavirus, it seems normal now, but before coronavirus, that was literally the reaction from good pastors. Is you're wasting your time, Pastor Chicolanti, and you're wasting my time talking about social media. I don't have any time for that. I'm doing the work of God. So we try to tell them, okay, but how many people can you meet physically? How many people can make an appointment with you? What if you could just, in, in one tweet, one Facebook post, one YouTube video, you could reach 100,000 people? At that time, I had 100,000. So what if you can reach 100,000 people? Well, they, they didn't see that. In fact, it was worse than that. Many pastors perceive online church, the, the word online church was perceived as heresy because you're stealing people from the physical church and people are supposed to only go to physical church and, and to even offer the option means that we were a threat to them. And strangely, they didn't realize many people came and got discipled by us. They, they learned water baptism is important, praying in tongues and being baptized in the Spirit is important, paying their tithes is important, and guess what? When they could, they ended up attending other churches physically and being a great blessing, being a prayer warrior in another church being a tither in another church. It did not help us. It helped Jesus' kingdom. But we kept doing that, but it was really, a, it was a tough slug. It was a hard, hard thing to plow and try to get any pastor to change their mind because they had a concept that this is how church is run. We've always run it this way, and Jesus himself would run it this way. God forbid Jesus go on social media. God forbid that he would reach people online. That, that just was foreign until coronavirus. And when coronavirus came, they locked down the churches, which looked like, I mean, goodness, it looked like the Antichrist had, had arrived, right? Churches are locked down. It's the first time in 2,000 years, global lockdown of churches. But guess what? God was in it. Can you extract the treasure out of the darkness? And God forced all pastors to go online. Now I can say, hey, I was a lonely prophetic voice speaking about this. You know, the critics, they never quote me when I get it spot on. We were spot on about online church. And we were building it while we we're getting criticized. And that's how prophecy works. We're still spot on about Trump winning. You look at Mike Lindell, what he's put out in, in a movie now. Absolute proof about what happened, the shenanigans that happened. What are you going to do? You're going to ignore the evidence and say fraud is okay? So, but it's going to take time. So while we're taking time seeing the prophecy unfold, you're going to have all these critics and people who just say, you know, I see dark, I see, I see dark, I see evil, rather than seeing light in the dark place. So I think most pastors now uh, have not gone back to the pre-coronavirus days and, and would even think that online church does not belong in the program. I think they all have, of every denomination. I'm amazed even the mainline denominations, some of the you know, very slow to change denominations, they're all online now. Great. So that's a third blessing. A second blessing. Third blessing. Third blessing. Now this is a strange one, but I want you to hear me out. The third blessing from coronavirus so far that we can say is, is a prophetic preparation for the second coming of Jesus is that it stopped the whole Christian world from going to Israel. You say, well, how is that a blessing? 
We have been leading tours to Israel, taking what you might call Bible pilgrims, Christian tourists, to Israel and Jordan. Sometimes people take pilgrims to Turkey because the churches of Revelation and other important churches are there. And some people go to Egypt, but since the Arab Spring, Egypt's been, you know, unstable. And I had planned since last year to take our first tour into Saudi Arabia. And that's still on the horizon, and I think God's going to push that open maybe even before Israel because it moves us towards the agenda of the end times. But right now, Israel's suffering. Right now, Israel is in her third lockdown. As of January 2021, Israel's gone into another lockdown. And that's got to be catastrophic for a nation that depends so much on Christian tourism. So what is the blessing? What is the light that we can extract out of the darkness? What is the hidden treasure in, it, in this? Well, what it's showing to the Jews, and I pray that it will become clear as fast as possible, is that the Jews cannot fulfill their destiny without the Christians. The Jews are not complete without us, fellow Torah believers, fellow Messiah followers. You will never be complete without us. So, in the past, Christians have been seeking the Jews. In the past, we seek the Jews. Like we try to learn how to uh, have a bagel and share the gospel. There's a book about that. We want to learn how to say things instead of a Gentile way, we say it in a Jewish way. Remember, that's the same principle we use when we evangelize the Buddhists. So there's nothing wrong with that. If you evangelize Muslims, you have to use Isa instead of Jesus. You evangelize Jews, you have to say Torah and Yeshua for the Word of God and for the name of the Messiah. So Christians have been seeking the Jews and, and laying the groundwork. Why? Because we know that part of the end time plan before Jesus comes back is at least one third of the Jews have to know something about Jesus and then accept him. But they won't accept Jesus. They use the name in their own Hebrew tongue, Yeshua HaMashiach. So we knew that that was part of the groundwork for the second coming of Jesus Christ. But what I think now God is forcing the Jews to realize is they have a responsibility to seek us. Because the mandate from the beginning, according to the template of Moses, is that the Jews would incorporate the Gentiles in the exodus to the promised land. They cannot make the exodus. It cannot be complete without the Gentile nations. But the Jews now, are, the onus is now going to be on them without any Christian visiting Israel. And all the Messianic congregations used to have Christian ministries come like us. Every time we go, we give money to all the different congregations that we can get to visit. Sometimes they invite me to preach. I preach, I end up most of the time giving money to them rather than receiving offering from them. And you find that in the book of Acts, that the believers from the different cities in Europe ended up collecting offerings to give to the Jews. And that was part of the first century practice, and now we're in the 21st century, and that's fine, but the Jews have taken this for, for granted. The Jews have been taught falsely that Christians are their enemy. No, there, were, there was bad history with the Catholics, but they were not born again. They were not following the Bible. Don't mix the Inquisition and the Crusades and all that with born-again Christianity, which is following Yeshua. We're following the Torah. So... I think the third blessing in disguise is that it is now time for the Jews to seek the Christians. We have 2,000 years of rich history preserving the gospel, preserving the word of God, untainted. Untainted. Now, I realize there's a lot of wisdom in rabbinical literature. There's a lot of wisdom in the Talmud. That's fine. But there's also a lot of corruption. If you say, well, the temple is gone, so we're just going to cleanse our own sins on the Day of Atonement by doing good for one day. If you say, well, we don't need the sacrifice. We don't need the blood anymore. No, that's a corruption of what Moses said to you. You cannot do away with the blood sacrifice. That's why Jesus was sacrificed, and then the blood sacrifice ended. There is a continuation to the story that we have preserved very well for 2,000 years. And not only that, by being empowered with the Holy Spirit, we have been performing signs and wonders and healings, just like Elijah and Elisha and the anointed prophets of old, regular Christians have been experiencing miracles and healings for 2,000 years. 
We've been able to pray and get answers for 2,000 years. So we cannot replace the Jews, but the Jews need to now understand, including the Messianic congregations, they cannot replace us. And you know, the Messianic congregation is on a wild spectrum of doctrine. From people who believe Jesus, Yeshua, definitely is divine, the Son of God, to people who absolutely deny, they say, yeah, we're Messianic, but Jesus cannot be God. We cannot accept that because the Jewish family would, would, would retaliate, would hate them, would reject them. And there's a lot of, honestly, kooky, flaky doctrine in the Messianic congregations. Even though I respect so much the Messianic movement, and I, I want us to learn so much from them. But this coronavirus is saying, it's time for you to reach out to the Christians. It's time for us to be one. One is not one way. You're like a guy who dates, who, who, on a date, you're the only one giving. You're the only one talking. After a while, you say, hey, this is a one-way street. And I'm not trying to belittle the relationship. We Christians are committed to the welfare of Israel and the salvation of the Jews. But at some point, the Jews are going to wake up and realize we're not their enemy. We're their friends. And you better treat us like friends because you won't have anybody else left. Then we are one new man. One new man is not one way dating the Jews and learning Jewish culture and Hebrew roots. It's time that they also learn the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's time they also learn how to operate in the gifts of the Spirit because you don't have much in the Old Testament about that. You have examples from people who are anointed, but in the, in the New Covenant, everybody can operate in that. We have something to give to them. They have something to give to us. We become complete. Jesus comes back. And through coronavirus, we're being shown things that we were unwilling to see and unwilling to change. We would not have been willing to move towards online church without coronavirus. And we would have kept going to Israel and pouring money into Israel without Israel ever looking back and saying, hey, we appreciate Christians and love Christians, and we are following the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We have negated no word in the Torah. All of the New Testament is a fulfillment of the Old Testament. Only fulfillment, no replacement. We don't replace you, you don't replace us. A lot of Christians are stuck on finding treasures in dark places. If you can't wrap your head around that, you're not really in Isaiah 45. You're in Isaiah 45, verse 1. Please, at least, let's get to verse 3, God is saying. Right? Fair enough? Let's get at least to verse 3. Then, I believe, God brings Donald Trump back and kicks his agenda of a great awakening forward. And the delay is nothing strange. Nothing strange to the Exodus, nothing strange to the whole Bible. So we're going to see how the Bible has laid out the, the plan and we're going to apply it into our own lives. Don't be discouraged is what I'm saying. Don't be discouraged. Don't see darkness and call it darkness. Don't see something not going the way that you thought and then start criticizing. There's no professional anointed critic in the body of Christ. Amen. Withhold all judgment now and let the prophecies unfold. If you just take dark things and condemn it and speak evil over it, you're not really like God. Because God takes bad things and turns it for good.